Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Chapter 1 of Language, Truth, and Logic, A.J. Ayer, after setting out the criterion of verifiability, which was really one of the central concepts and fulcrums of this entire work, will provide us with some useful examples so we can see how this criterion is actually applied. And he'll give you many, many more throughout the rest of the work, but these are the, the three sets of uh, examples that, that follow immediately on setting out uh, the, the criterion of verifiability. And the criterion, let's remind ourselves, basically says that in order for a statement to be meaningful, um, unless it's a tautology, in which case it's always true, it has to have some literal significance, and that literal significance consists in being able to say what sort of experiential, or sometimes he says e empirical propositions or claims would follow from that. What, what is it that you could, in fact, verify by observation, at least in principle and at least as being probable? There are you know, different versions of verification. Air says that in principle, is enough. So we can ask ourselves for any given set of claims or assertions, what would have to be the case in order for us to actually say <clears throat> that this is true? What would make us uh, agree to this? So he uses as a prime example to begin with this notion that the world of sense experience is altogether Unreal, And some people do say things like that. So um, saying that, that uh, uh, our sense experience is a deception or planted in our minds by an evil genius a la Descartes or that perhaps we're in the matrix or, or anything along those lines. If we want to say that uh, the world of sense experience is altogether false, we're unable to verify that. Why? He says that, well, we have to admit our senses do in fact um, deceive us. You know, we, we could look at the examples that Descartes uses in the meditations and discourses like the round tower, the square tower that at a distance appears round or the stick that's put into the water appears bent, but it's not really bent. The sun looks like it's a little small ball, but we know it's actually much, much larger. We go on and on and on with these. But Ayer says, well, how do we know that our senses are deceiving us? Well, <clears throat> we rely on other observations coming from our senses. He says that we may, as a, the, the result of having certain sensations, expect other sensations to be obtainable, which are in fact not obtainable. You know, for, for example, we uh, drink a drink and we think that it's going to have a certain taste because of the way it looks, and it tastes very different. And we're like, whoa, what's going on there? But we are sensing, right? We're using sense experience to do that. So he says, we say that the senses deceive us, because the expectations to which our sense experiences give rise do not always accord with what we subsequently experience. So we're relying on our senses to substantiate whether or not the judgments that we have that are based on our sensations are correct or not. So we're, we're verifying those. But can we globalize it? Could we say, well, all of my sense experiences are actually deceptive? What experience would lead you to, to conclude that? How would you, in fact make that claim and verify it. Ayer says that there, there simply is no way. You cannot do that. There is, as he says, no conceivable observation 
or set of observations which would show us that all of our sense experiences or the world of sense experience is unreal. He says that, that there's, there's no possibility of it. So anyone, he says, who condemns the sensible world as a world of mere appearance as opposed to reality is saying something which, according to our criterion of significance, is literally nonsensical. Now, they might be saying something that has a, a metaphorical meaning or an emotive meaning. They may, might be saying, oh, the world is valueless. It sucks. You know, it's no good. But that would be an emotive meaning, right? There'd be a value judgment being made there. If they're literally saying that the world of appearance does not give us any reality, that there's something lying behind it, or perhaps everything is empty, Air would say, well... There's no way to verify that. The next thing that he talks about is the argument, or let's say rather being more technical, controversy between monists and what he's calling pluralists, which pretty much everybody who's not a monist, right? But we could expand this. We could talk about dualists. We could talk about those who believe that there's this determinant number of entities or anything like that. So the monist, what makes them a monist is the assertion that metaphysically everything is one. Um, Parmenides is, is a prime example. Spinoza, another prime example. Hegel has sometimes been interpreted as a monist because of his uh, discussion of spirit or geist or mind, right? And so the monist is asserting that reality is one substance. The pluralist is saying, no, there's more than one thing. Could be a million things, could be, you know, three things, could be whatever you want. They're just saying reality is multiple substances. Now, that sounds like it makes sense, right? Isn't there a possible controversy there? Air says, well, how would you verify that? He goes on and he says that... Uh, it's admitted both by monists and pluralists that it's impossible to imagine any empirical situation which would be relevant to the solution of their dispute. You can provide all sorts of intellectual reasonings for it, but there's no, there's no observations that you can make that would lead you to say that there are indeed multiple substances. Why not? Because well, you might say, well, the pluralist is actually at an advantage here. They can like say, well, look, here's, uh, if we're going to, pretend to be a G more, here's one hand, here is another. Yeah, but the hands might be said to be part of this one substance that's me. Okay, so far so good. You got me, and then you got the chalkboard. I'm clearly not the same thing as the chalkboard, or me and you. Well, the monist can say, ah, oh, yeah, I understand that you see things that way, but it is, in fact, these are just modes of one primal substance. You think that they're actually different from each other, but they're not actually different from each other. And at that point, you have to say, what? Uh, how, how can you actually prove this? And the monist will say, well, I can't prove it by empirical observation. As a matter of fact, empirical observation would lead you to think that there's multiple things, but that's where empirical observation has gone wrong. There's no way to verify, or for that matter, falsify the assertion of the monist, which means that the monist is literally saying, according to Ayer, nonsense. He says, that if we're told there's no possible observation that could give any probability either to the assertion that reality was one substance or to the assertion that it was many, we must conclude that the, neither assertion is significant. And again, Significant, he means in a literal sense, where we're talking about you know, matters of fact. If we're talking about our emotions or we're being metaphorical or poetic, well, we can say all this stuff that we want, but that's a different use of language. Uh, the third one that he talks about is the realists and the idealists. And here he brings in a little bit of a uh, discursus into talking about art and how we determine whether it's genuine art or not. He says... Um, a simple illustration will help to demonstrate this. Let us suppose a picture is discovered and the suggestion made that it was painted by Goya. 
There is a definite procedure for dealing with such a question. What is the definite procedure? The experts, the art historians, the uh, people who engage in, you know, restoration, whoever that is, right? They examine the picture to see in what ways it resembles the accredited works of Goya and to see if it bears any marks which are characteristic of a forgery. They look up contemporary records for evidence of the existence of a picture and so on. And so, you know, what, what is going on here? They're carrying out a process of inquiry and research. And much of this is an appeal to empirical propositions. Is there a, a name for this painting that corresponds to the little, you know, thing on the, the uh, frame here that's in this book over here? That's, that's an empirical uh, fact that you can either say, yes, it, it is, or no, it isn't, or perhaps we need more research. You can look for marks of forgery. That's going to be a matter of probabilities, of course. You don't have to be absolutely certain about it. And as he points out, could be that these experts will actually disagree, but here's the key thing. Each one knows what empirical evidence would go to confirm or discredit his opinion. Each of them could say, listen, I think it's a forgery because I see these signs here, uh, but I would be willing to have my mind changed if there was some way of accounting for how these came to be, or if I found out that these aren't really marks of a forgery. And the other could say, I, I think it's genuine because it really does resemble Goya's stuff. And that, but I could be convinced otherwise if I found out that, you know, looking through a book, he had an understudy who did similar paintings and, and described this painting. So they're talking about empirical propositions that could verify or disconfirm the hypothesis or judgment that they are making. What about if we talk about this painting in light of the realists versus idealists? Now, what are, our, what are realists in this sense? This is a metaphysical doctrine that says that, you know, physical objects, things that we think are real, perhaps other things as well, but let's just stick with physical objects. They are objectively real. They are outside of us. They are not just objects or ideas in our minds or in the divine mind. They really exist. When I turn my back, it's still there looking at it right now. Now you see it's there, of course. But the realist says that the painting, whoever it's by, whether it's by Goya or not, is objectively real. And they don't mean objectively real in the sense that Goya really painted it, but somebody really painted it, and it exists independently of any observer. The idealist asserts instead that the painting is a set of ideas in our minds or in the mind of God or, you know, perhaps in some other mind, right? And, and those who think that we're actually living within a uh, computer-generated matrix would be in a certain sense idealists in this sense, wouldn't they? So uh, he goes on and he says, in the ordinary sense of real, in which it is opposed to illusory, the reality of the picture is not in doubt, They've satisfied themselves that it is real by having a correlated series of uh, sensations of sight and sensations of touch. But could they discover whether the picture was real in the sense in which real is opposed to ideal? He says, clearly, there's no decision procedure for this. There's no way to do that. And then he concludes, if this is so, the problem is fictitious according to our criteria. So... Each of these provides us with an example of how this criterion of verifiability would be applied to the typical metaphysical disputes that were coming up around the time of A.J. Eyre and which do uh, arise in our own time uh, and will probably be around for centuries yet to come. Uh, they go far back into the history of philosophy as well. According to Eyre, None of these actually are verifiable, and so the metaphysics that they claim to express is merely nonsense in a literal sense.